I don't know where I should be speaking. I'll look at my own camera. <laughs> um, welcome to everyone joining us here today, here at the Department of Anthropology and on Zoom. We're very lucky um, to have this event. So my name is Yogi Abiral, and I'm a PhD candidate here at Hopkins. And it's with great pleasure that I will facilitate thank this panel on the city electric infrastructure and ingenuity in post-socialist Tanzania. Uh, Michael Degani, the author of this amazing book, requires a little introduction for many, but let me introduce him nonetheless for those who may not be familiar with his work. Um, Mike Degani is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. He received his PhD in anthropology from Yale University in 2015. His research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the Wiener Grant Foundation, and the Fulbright Hayes Foundation. Most recently, he was an American Council of Learned Societies postdoctoral fellow. He's currently a curator of the Ecological Design Collective and an affiliate of the Ralph S. O'Connor Sustainable Energy Institute and the Center for Africana Studies. His brother, in addition to infrastructure and electricity, his broader interests include the aesthetics of precarity, eco-poetics, person semiotics and anthropological exchange theory, and the politics of renewable energy. His book, The City Electric, was published by the University Press only a few weeks ago, and we're pleased for this opportunity to celebrate its release and think together about its intellectual contributions and significance for anthropology and Africana studies. We're joined today by distinguished guests from different parts of the world. Dr. Mohamed Yunus Rafiq, Dr. Yakche Ginal, Dr. Gretchen Bakke, and Dr. Sabin Mohamed will each comment on the book. Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, and you will each have uh, 15 minutes for your comments, after which we will leave the floor to Mike for a response. Then we will open the floor um, for questions and a discussion. Before we proceed, I would like to also thank um, a moment to um, take a moment to thank those who make this event possible. We're grateful for the support of the Department of Anthropology, the Ralph S. O'Connor Sustainable Energy Institute, the Center for Africana Studies, and towards an open monograph ecosystem home, which is part of the Milton Eisenhower Library here at Hopkins, and they have uh, sponsored this book to be uh, open access. Um, so thanks, thanks to Tom's support, and we have uh, Laurel um, here today uh, to give us a short introduction about open access. And we will be, uh, I will be giving the floor to her after the uh, presentation before we go on to Mike, if that's okay. Um, okay, without further ado, let me introduce our first guest. Um, Mohamed Yunus Rafiq is an assistant professor fellow at New York University in Shanghai. A professor Rafiq's research focuses on the use of human and non-human intermediaries in the provision of health services in post-social Tanzania. In May 2017, Professor Rafiq received his PhD in anthropology from Brown University with a specialization in medical anthropology. His fieldwork and dissertation have been supported by Fulbright Hayes, Benner Grant, and Harvard Kennedy, fellow, Kennedy School Fellowships. Dr. Rafiq is currently working on several publication projects based on his previous research. This includes articles and book chapters on topics such as the construction of religious figures as public health actors, the role of community health workers as intermediaries between the state and the citizenry, and religious forms of public health governance in post-socialist Tanzania. Professor Rafiq is joining us from Shanghai, I believe. Um, very, it is very late, so we're very grateful <laughs> to you for being here, and we look forward to your comments. You may have, you may proceed. Um, Did you say I can proceed? Yes. Uh, is my voice thank, coming through okay? Yes, it's coming, uh, it's coming through okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting uh, me to give my reflection on Mike Degani's uh, uh, City Electric. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, reading this book. Uh, like any good ethnography, it connected uh, events, actions, and practices, some very naturalized, uh, like cramming into a Daladala Dala bus during the rush hour in Dar es Salaam, uh, to something uh, larger, rooted in history, specific political and social processes like the Ujamaa socialist period in Tanzania, 
or uh, was he the market reform uh, period in Tanzania? And I think also what a good eth ethnography does, it um, makes us learn about others and at the end really learned about ourselves. So after th uh, thinking uh, how best to share my reactions and comments uh, to City Electric, I've decided to respond to how a Tanzanian would read this book. And uh, here I'm not claiming my reading is representative of all Tanzanians or whether I have a kind of an exceptional or privileged epistemology, uh, but I had an honor uh, and uh, privilege to be part of the earlier phases of Mike Degani's uh, field work in, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, so a lot of memories uh, came back uh, reading this book, and it's uh, really wonderful uh, to see this project uh, completed. Uh, moreover, uh, most uh, I think most of what uh, Mike is uh, writing, uh, historical, empirical, uh, ethnographic uh, moments, is something that I've experienced coming of age in the 1990s during the transitional transition period from Ujamaa to market reform uh, period or the post-socialist uh, period, if you will. So my first reaction is about uh, politics of uh, veranda and air conditioner, air conditioner politics. Um, Mike suggests uh, in City Electric, one way to look at the neoliberal neo neo reform in Africa uh, and uh, particularly maybe the, uh, the reform period in Tanzania uh, which is uh, inextricably tied with the fiascos and the drama of the national electric company, Tanesco, is through the politics of veranda. And politics of veranda uh, refers to, or is characterized by patrimon patrimonial networks indifferent to the rule of law. Uh, to me, it refers uh, to Vigogo, uh, this group of uh, elite, uh, self-enriching uh, Tanzanians who emerged during this chaotic uh, period who privatized the national parastatals and as Mike uh, shows us very well in the book, sabotage the national's power supply. Uh, another way that uh, uh, Mike is uh, suggesting us to look at neoliberal reform in, in, in Africa and in places like Tanzania uh, is through the air conditioner politics. This refers to a type of politics and governance narrowly focused on procedure and technocratic fixes, which are times political and anti-political. My own work is with NGOs and donor agencies, and we see this kind of dynamic uh, a lot. So let me begin with the politics of Veranda. I, I found this uh, very interesting. Uh, and in fact, uh, I must admit, uh, I came rather late to learn about the politics of Veranda uh, when discussing Mike, my own uh, Phil Nock experiences, and he said, "Did you read my stuff on politics of veranda?" You know, uh, so it, <laughs> it, it really connected. Uh, you think you know a guy, right? Uh, uh, when when reading politics of veranda, and in fact translating the term in Kiswahili, I began thinking of another Swahili term called baraza. So I was trying to put myself. Uh, as someone who has read the book, how would I explain to other Tanzanians about this book? Or there are two Tanzanians meeting, including myself, and we are discussing this book. And uh, I should add that the dramas and the fiascos about uh, uh, Tanesco has even ramped up in the last few uh, weeks. Uh, so it is a very timely uh, contribution and, and the dramas uh, don't seem to subside. And some of the characters uh, like um, uh, January Makamba, who uh, Mike talks about uh, in the book, have re-emerged uh, as Minister of um, Energy. Um, so uh, many Tanzanian would translate veranda into Kiswahili. Uh, baraza, uh, um, uh, baraza is this uh, space immediately outside your house where Tanex Tanesco technicians would install the electric meter. I, I, Baraza is a quasi public uh, space because um, it, is, uh, uh, it is a porch uh, outside your house. So it's a kind of private, you might have some control over it, 
but it's not entirely yours because uh, Tinesco could come anytime to uh, to read the meters. Uh, and um, Baraza is uh, this forum where all kinds of discussions from sports to politics happen. It is a typical feature of many Swahili households in Dar es Salaam and other parts of Tanzania. So this would, will be different from when uh, Mike is talking about these gated houses where most of middle, uh, middle class people live. But in places where uh, Mike started his earlier, uh, earlier um, research, uh, you will find this kind of uh, uh, space and architecture. So uh, my first question to Mike is, do you, do you see a connection uh, between Baraza and Veranda? Because um, uh, to me, uh, it struck me that they are somehow separated. Uh, so I'll say a little bit more. I bring this connection because many Tanzanians would first uh, draw this parallel. And I think the two are, the two are related. Uh, some of the decisions actually about pri privatization of these parast parastatals and including, uh, including Tanesco did in fact happen in Baraza-like spaces. Uh, you know, uh, Mike, you know the famous Baraza in Saigon Club where, where you did your uh, initial field work this was a place where high level politicians would come to speak about sports, sports or hunting, uh, including the now prime minister, Kasim Majaliwa, uh, mm -hmm. who frequently uh, visited the Baraza. In fact, people in Kariako would say that the high ranking party and poli state politicians would come to speak with Waze, the elders in the Baraza, and also to come to get the reading of the nation's pulse uh, in these forums. Uh, but it was in fact in these places where some of these behind the scenes and plans actually happened. Uh, I had an opportunity of uh, 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 to witness one of them, uh, not very far from uh, Mike, where you were hanging out with Dunkey and Bestie uh, in, in, in downtown. Uh, it was not related to Tanesco, uh, but reviving the national, uh, the Tanzanian national air carrier ATC in 2017 during Magufuli's time. Um, so you talk about Baraza on page two, uh, two, uh, 201. You refer to it when telling the story of your introduction to this uh, street forum and the exchanges there and your schooling by Maelstro, Maelstro Ali in the art of tapering and downing Kahawa coffee. I don't recall you connecting it back to the politics of Baranda. Uh, are these terms connected uh, in one form or another? You talk about Kijiwe uh, and Maskani, uh, which I would, I would say are types of uh, Baraza. Uh, however, uh, unlike Baraza, Kijiwe and Maskani are associated with the jobless uh, youth and people who are dealing with kind of shadowy practices like the Vishoka. Uh, your, discuss this, your discussion of Baraza and uh, Varanda is not connected because it seems like Baraza is um, operating more at the street level negotiation and the life of electricity, while Varanda is this high level where the Vigogo are kind of, you know, talking, scheming, creating this, uh, these, these plans. However, I'm, I, 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 I think many Tanzanians will bring them together. Uh, so uh, that's one, and this takes me to my second point. The depiction of politics of uh, Veranda strikes me to be mostly uh, negative, namely the criminal criminalization and parceling of the state without the oversight of someone. Nyerere was there, Mike, and the hardcore uh, Wajama, why didn't they do anything? Um, the public had little, if anything, to say in the early 1990s when everyone, everything went to sale. And I remember, I remember those days and the confu confusion so many people felt like what is actually going on? We are seeing companies being taken on by new people, but what is the process? Um, yet, if we agree that politics of Baranda and politics of Baraza are similar, then Barada, Barada, Baraza reads as a kind of a positive space, a place of meeting, sociality, remember your training on how to drink the coffee and the conversation and the jokes. Um, 
and um, of course, uh, forging connections and it's a part of uh, local identity. In other words, it works to connect while the politics of veranda are about disconnection or a connection of uh, certain groups of, of people uh, who are untouchables. How do you reconcile these two readings of uh, Baraza slash uh, Veranda? I understand the political veranda that you are referring to are happening at a different scale among government and politician, but as you know, uh, there are these points of co convergence. Um, I, I wonder what you think of this reading and suggestion of locating political uh, veranda within the politics of Baraza. Um, and I wonder why you didn't <laughs> you didn't call it politics of Baraza uh, instead of calling them politics of uh, Veranda. So I would like to shift here uh, to the politics of air condition, mm. uh, which is another very fresh and grounded way of looking at uh, liberal uh, reform and government from other analytics, problematic analytics, I would say, such as the idea of the dysfunctional state or failed state. Uh, your discussion in the politics uh, uh, politics of uh, air condition via Kelsal and Emmanuel Terry situate the, the, the moment or the, of, of um, this kind of politics during the entry of NGOism, uh, which, um, tries to bring order and accountability to the chaos and grab and land techniques of the people of Veranda beginning in the 1990s. Um, the politics of air condition, um, the way it is used in the book, uh, seem to suggest that it has come from outside of Tanzania, right? It has come with this, NGOs with donors and development agencies. Um, but is, is this really a product or, or, or is the point of emergence really when NGO, NGO starts to coming in, come, come in, in in the 1990s? Uh, does the politic of uh, the politics of air condition, uh, or does the politics of honing into procedure and technical fixes uh, just located within the emergence of AG NGOism and para, uh, transparency uh, fray, uh, phase. Uh, let me cl clarify. What I mean is, could they be other genealogies of this kind of politic? Um, uh, it has always uh, surprised me when speaking to friends who have come from Nigeria and other parts of Africa, they'll say, you Tanzanians love paper. And I don't mean money. We love this kind of repetitive uh, procedures uh, uh, technical details, uh, hierarchy. Uh, it's not simple task to just get a birth certificate. You have to ac really accumulate a lot of papers. And of course, this is not a guarantee you will end up getting the birth certificate, okay? But the paper trail is very important. Um, so does the political of air condition uh, perhaps form a layer of much older uh, practices of measuring of verifying, of ass assessing, of categorizing from uh, perhaps the period of Uyama when Tanzania was trying to build an industrial state. Uh, all the Tanzanian would tell you this, uh, this, uh, this ritual of collecting paper and following process, uh, getting permissions and consulting different hierarchies. And in fact, uh, in some cases for us researchers, it's getting even worse now, getting um, uh, research permits because of how many steps steps that you have to take. Yeah. Um, write, writing, about, uh, uh, writing about Ghana, uh, Ghana's custom, Brenda Shalfin argues that the customs operate, uh, uh, customs in, in Ghana operate more like industries where procedure and technical details are privileged. And this is a continuity from the industrial era, which failed to create an industrial base. Uh, but what is interesting in Shalfin's example is that the industries uh, the interests are not there, yet the social era practices of verifying, inspecting, measuring, and other technical, pro technical procedures are still present and, and uh, maybe migrated to other sectors such as the importation of cars. Like Ghana, Tanzania also embarked in building various industries, uh, the high modernist period that James, Stokes, uh, James Scott wrote about. 
Uh, TANESCO was uh, very important in building Tanzanian industrial base. Then as it is now, uh, Tanzania under Magufuli has uh, declared uh, is no longer alive. I hope uh, President Samir Suru Hassan is continuing with the vision of an industrial, uh, industrial uh, mid-industrial state in 20, 2025. My point is, I'm a bit skeptical to give all the credit of politics of air condition, of attention to procedure, technical fi fixes to only the de uh, donor development agency, NGOs. As pointed on page uh, 189, the call for procedure and technoc uh, technocratic fixes could be a residue of the post-socialist life that endures, the, uh, in, that endures despite uh, ruptures. And if I have more time, I have other comments. Um, we, we are at 15 minutes, but we could give you okay. a few more minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't think I can finish uh, in two minutes, but I'll make an attempt. I, I think the last one is, uh, Mike, you talk about um, uh, very interesting, uh, interesting that the genealogy or the origins of power, electric power generation uh, layers or is transposed uh, onto much older uh, roots and roots of uh, Swahili caravan, yeah, um, and um, uh, and then uh, some of the early uh, early um, sources of power was this diesel generation of of, of power. Uh, but at the same time, I wonder where does this leave uh, leave missionary infrastructure? Uh, the trade routes, the trade routes um, were also uh, also um, created um, uh, created um, the means for missionaries to build stations, uh, which uh, followed was followed by schools, was followed by by uh, hospitals, farms. I, I think what I'm trying to get here is uh, after Tanzania declared that private uh, power gener generation uh, partners could be, could, could, could enter the market, uh, you have a prominence of missionary institution. And maybe I'm spilling too many beans. This is your, is your second research. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, for me, it doesn't seem it's just uh, something new. Uh, is it possible that there is a kind of a, a connection here of these missionary stations that were uh, found in these caravan routes and, and, um, and their prominence now in providing, uh, in, in generating power? Uh, did they just happen to be in places where uh, they are endowed with water, or there is much uh, older historical trajectory here. So what is this connection between missionary uh, infrastructure and power generation? Because in Tanzania, we cannot talk about social, social, uh, social service infrastructure without the missionary institution. And I, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, and we will have time also to come back to your comments during the discussion. Um, so we have that opportunity. But it was um, very enlightening to hear about how, you know, how Tanzanians would think about the book and um, work through some of the concepts through that perspective. Thank you very much. Um, so um, next, uh, we turn to uh, Professor Gunal. Um, Gyokce Gunal is Associate Professor in Anthropology at Rice University. Her latest book, Spaceship in the Desert, Energy, Climate Change, and Urban Design in Abu Dhabi um, from the University Press, focuses on the construction of renewable energy and clean technology infrastructures in the United Arab Emirates, more specifically concentrating on the Mazdar City project. Uh, Professor Gunal, we're very happy to have you um, join us today. Um, you may start. Thank you. You are muted. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, to this event. It's a pleasure to discuss Mike Degani's book, The City Electric, with you and to share some reflections. So I have to start by saying that this is an extremely rich text that weaves together a range of literatures in anthropology, Africana studies, and critical theory 
while consistently remaining attuned to the ethnographic to ethnographic practice in its best sense. So I'd like to congr first congratulate Mike Degani for this achievement. So most of my own work looks at how infrastructures transform in the face of energy and climate change related challenges. So when I so I learned a lot from the city electric in this regard. And of course, I have many questions about Degani's, Degani's understanding of independent power producers in this context and whether their material qualities or their countries of origin shaped the ways they were perceived by decision makers and what are the futures they enacted in Tanzania. I also wonder how we can think about the global transformation of energy infrastructure by looking at this particular context and would be excited to hear exactly where climate change would fit within this particular narrative. But for now, let me set some of these uh, more energy and climate change related questions aside and start try to describe the city electric. And what I say about it here will not do it justice, but uh, I'll give it a try. So as I was reading the city electric, I found myself noting down all the metaphors that I encountered. First, I listed all the animate beings I noticed in the book, mostly used as metaphors or conceptual frameworks to describe the unanticipated, the unruly, the emergent. First and foremost, of course, is the metaphor of the parasite. The Ghani not only interacts with people who employ the idea of the parasite in asking who eats and at whose expense, but also learns from the work of uh, Michel Say, whereby the parasite is an interruption of a relation. So here, the Ghani is seeking to bridge African and Western perspectives and producing convivial scholarship. For instance, in the introduction to the book, the Ghani argues that in the Tanzanian context, the proliferation of parasites index growing misalignments between the shared pact linking rulers and ruled and the distribution of material resources that made that pact plausible and efficacious, renewing citizen participation in it. So as I enjoyed the fable-like characteristics of this book, I began noticing the bat, the shark, the snake. <laughs> So, for instance, on page 126, uh, the, as the Ghani narrates his experiences of working as a, as a Vishoka, he mentions how one angry customer referred to us as popo or bats for the strange ways workers hung from utility poles. As I was unfamiliar with the word, he says, popo was explained to me as that strange animal that's both a bird and a beast, since it has wings but also has milk. Later on in the book on page 191, Degani extends his animal metaphors about Vishoka. When Vishoka are officially denounced as thieves or saboteurs, electricians crack wise that Vishoka are nothing compared to the Vishoka Papa, literally the shark Vishoka, with access to government contracts and influence. Or to use another animal metaphor, he says, they observe that, they observe that the child of a snake is a snake. So in the book, all of these wiggly moving creatures are used to depict both a struggle to stay alive and an ambition to change things, an emergence that might at times result in exploitation and other times generate mutual benefit. Parasites and perhaps bats, snakes and sharks too operate at multiple scales. We see the parasite taking shape in the form of an international independent power producer, in the form of a government entity and in the form of a repair person. I don't want to oversimplify the Ghani sophisticated project here, but in some sense, we can argue that these living beings somehow rely on and reproduce modal reasoning, a concept that forms the center of the Ghani's book. For the Ghani, modal reasoning implies an active investigation and evaluation of claims about what's possible, impossible, essential, necessary, contingent, and making decisions based on such contextual and embodied experiences. Then there were all the metaphors that take inspiration from inanimate technologies, complementing the lively parasites, bats, snakes, and sharks. So we start with veranda politics and air conditioning politics in the first chapter of the book, and uh, the previous speaker already gave a very thorough uh, explanation of what, what these stand for. So in, for, but I'll just very briefly mention it here again. In describing post-socialist Tanzania on page 38, for instance, the Ghani suggests the first wave of 1980s era neoliberalism involved the macroeconomic shock treatments of structural adjustment, austerity, privatization, and deregulation, and refers and broadly refers to uh, these uh, political conditions as the politics of the veranda, characterized by patrimonial networks indifferent to the rule of law. So next, we're confronted with another wave of political transformations, uh, call it a politics of the air conditioner, Degani suggests. 
Like many reformisms, it's often anemic, narrowly focused on procedure and technocratic fixes. Sometimes these techno fixes are obviously anti-political as when prepaid meters in South Africa reinforce apartheid legacies of black segregation and marginalization. Other times they're just ineffectual. And again, um, Degani continues, if neoliberalism means anything in post-colonial Africa, it must refer to the layering of air conditioner technopolitics over the veranda style patrimonialism. While these metaphors investigate the making of statecraft in Tanzania, there are per they're perhaps not enough to explain why and how people in Tanzania respond to such statecraft. The, books, the book asks, why are they okay with it? So in chapter two, we read about the Dala Dala, the popular minibus uh, shared taxis of Tanzania as a metaphor for the nation, where everyone's stuck within an uncomfortable vehicle suffering in solidarity. As Degani says on page 95, but then what can one do? One's obliged. In this sense, the random movements and adjustments are not mere physical hardships, but meaningful sacrifices, pragmatic expressions of a governing logic, a commitment to sociality as such. To extend the Ghani's metaphor, here it seems like the social contract is both the interiority of the bus itself and its metal of unbendable boundaries, rendering it difficult for passengers to make an exit. The only possibility then is to open the windows a bit, letting some air flow inside. I found myself thinking that these technological metaphors then stand here in, in a kind of opposition to the model reasoning of the bat, the snake, the shark. They're inelastic and somewhat suffocating despite their associations with the open air. In this case, and perhaps this is a question for Degani, does the marrying of such technopolitics and patrimonialism, which crushes its citizens inside an airless minibus, then stand in as the ultimate other of modal reasoning? Finally, we can ask, where does this framework leave the biggest technological object in the book, the electric grid? Needless to say, the grid is not a metaphor here. It's, instead, it's the overarching social form that structures the book. Even if many of its elements are transformed, the whole does not necessarily fall apart. I couldn't comfortably place it alongside the air conditioner, the veranda, and the minibus. With all its intricacies, the grid in this context is the ultimate manifestation of statecraft. We see it shifting in the hands of parasites, small and large, and we observe how it asserts its high modernist aspirations to crush those parasites at times. So perhaps I'll end my brief comments by asking how uh, Mike Degani would reflect on the use of metaphor in his book and how he would connect the use of these metaphors to the conception of modal reasoning. And this is a book I look forward to teaching and rereading in the future. And I'm excited to hear how everyone else interpreted it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, these were great comments. Um, <clears throat> really um, pushing us to think more holistically about all these metaphors that appear. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, so we will um, <clears throat> we will continue to our next speaker, um, Professor Bakke. Um, Gretchen Bakke holds a PhD from the University of Chicago in cultural anthropology. Her work focuses on the chaos and creativity that emerged during social, cultural, and technological transitions. After a decade of researching and writing about the energy transition in the United States, she's currently conducting research on the end of oil and gas in the Northern North Sea. Bakke, the Professor Bakke is a former fellow in Wesleyan University's Science and Society program, a former Fulbright fellow, and is, is, it currently holds a Heisenberg position at the Integrative Research Institute on Transformations of Human Environment at Humboldt University and a research fellowship at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, also in Berlin. Professor Bakke is the author of The Grid, a 2016 Bill Gates pick, and the 2020 ethnography, The Likeness, Semblance and Self in a Slovene Society, as well as two co-edited volumes together with Mary Peterson on anthropology and the arts. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. I believe you're joining us from Berlin, approximately midway between the United States and Schengen. We look forward to your comments. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not so late. <laughs> it's not so late yet. Tending toward lateness. Um, thank you so much for the invitation um, and also for the opportunity to read the book. Um, I was I have not gotten the paper copy yet, so it's great as well that it was downloadable um, 
and uh, it's ex made accessible that way. I feel like it's such a good thing that's happening with um, publishing now that that's possible. So um, thanks again. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, well, we'll see. It's, in some ways, I think it um, fits relatively well with what everyone else has said. So hopefully that will, um, our, our comments will align in such a way that are, that are most useful um, sort of to further conversation and also my to whatever work um, you take after a book. It's also always a question to me what, when a book is done, especially a book that's only been out for two weeks and then now you have comments about it, how how that becomes anything else. Um, or if they just sort of go straight to the circular file and, and you think about them again in a decade or so. Um, but um, so um, I always say to usually very doubtful engineers that electric grids are not naturally given form by the physics of electricity. They are rather in their extent and their operations, things made of culture, of values and politics and regimes of expertise and natural environments and geography and how all of these change with time and in relationship with one another. I think that this does not need to be said to a room full of anthropologists. But I wanted to start there because I feel like the City Electric makes this point in spades. By, by the end, and even to some degree at the very beginning, the ways in which the electrical infrastructure is shown not to be neutral, and even in many cases, not even to be a thing at all, is remarkable. There is no electric grid, I have this in quotes, that, um, that, tra travels, this, that travels this world, right? There is no sort of neutral electric grid that travels this world, this planet, right? Being plopped down contextless into one place and then another and then another. There is in some way in this story, in this story of this grid, right? This particular grid, um, this particular electrical system as it comes to be in this particular place. I think this is a great, um, one of the great offerings of the book is how much it's impossible to imagine a neutral or contextless electrical system. Um, this, however, does not make the grid unrecognizable. Words like meter or refrigerator or pole shine forth with familiarity, air conditioner, right, as has been mentioned. But it does raise the question for the anthropologist of what to do with it. Does one use the human pushing and pulling at this device to tell the larger story of how a political, economic, and cultural space both performs and constitutes itself, an ethnography of this particular place electric. This is what I've done in my own work, um, which is on the United States. And I also think that it's what Mike Degani has done here in this book with Tanzania. And to some extent, right, to Tanzania, to some extent, Tanzania, and more particularly with Dar es Salaam. He's used the grid as it is made and made functional as a route into a story about human life worlds, um, how we live through or how they live through and by means of infrastructure. But Degani also does a bit of something else. And this is interesting to me. On the return voyage of the circuit of power by making people into elements of this infrastructure, not planners or utility men, or investors, right, so much, but with this feeling of a man. So I don't mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, we can think of people as being elements of an electric grid in a traditional way, which is to say planners or utility men or investors, right? But here there's something else happening where the human um, becomes, or the man actually, specifically individual men become a kind of stretch of grid, right? Um, holding it, perhaps, right? Growing it, perhaps. But not in, not in a way that is somehow working on it, or I think you're going beyond working on this grid, right? As humans, as working on it, to say that this thing actually has an expanse or an extension through the bodies of the people in the city. Um, I'm not sure how well this works in the book, but I feel like the impulse, and, and I also, I have a little slide, which I'll show you, is this is an attempt to close a kind of circuit or to create a kind of circuit in which it's not only 
that an electrical, doing a careful research of an electrical system can show us something about a social, political, economic, and cultural world. But that in fact, how an electrical system is lived can show us something about the nature of infrastructure as not technological, right? And here again, I wanna move away from the, the paperwork. Um, and though I didn't write this in my comments, I love the post-socialism in this book. So the fact that there's so much paperwork, <laughs> um, it's great. You really you get it, that's great. Um, so I think, so in this sort of attempt to, um, to, to, to conceptualize an infrastructure, which is not merely cables and wires and poles, and then those who sort of service it, but like to get the human into the substance of it. I think of cartilage, of the way, for example, a knee works because a bone is held separate from and also joined to another bone by a different sort of material. This other material, this cartilage works as both cushion and glue. The functionality of the knee depends upon how what is hard is tempered by and also constituted by what is soft. The meter and the man who finds it, brings it and installs it and charges for it. Perhaps a utility man, perhaps not. Power flows, sort of. Money flows. It's a very dispersed, in a very dispersed sort of way. And the infrastructure by this means is not only a circuit, um, which is to say, what you talk a lot about this, uh, the current moving in one direction and the currency in the other, right? It's not only a circuit when defined in this way, but it's intertwined in fact with everything else. So at home, we laughingly call this, um, and I can say this because my husband is also an engineer. Um, and so we make really boring jokes um, about engineering related subjects. Um, we call this man in loop, right? Quite simply, man in loop. Um, that is to say, a thing doesn't work unless there's a human being there to press a button at some point or to do something at some point. And you expand this, and I imagine, like, I actually imagine the sort of human touching two people, like, almost as if the electricity flows through. And in fact, there are the shocks, right? There are these moments where electricity is flowing through the human body. This is sort of, I imagine this, um, this man in loop as as also a not quite a perfect, but a figure that you're interested in, right? Um, and in North America, it's always the, the desire is always that um, you should design the man out of the loop uh, so that the system works better. So it achieves, achieves higher functionality if you can get the person out. Um, so nobody ever really does this, but it's often, it's sort of the dream of, of the perfectly, uh, in, in perfectly technological infrastructure. So here I could talk about the internet of things, which is this dream in, in, a, in a sort of, sort of the ultimate version of this dream um, because, of, because it is this way of pulling the man out of the loop. So your uh, electric meter then just talks to your dishwasher and tells it to turn on because the price of electricity has reached a certain point. So you don't ever have to even interact anymore with your dishwasher or with your meter or with your electricity system or with money. You don't need to know anything. And this should then produce a kind of perfect, uh, perfectly functional, um, perfectly balanceable electric grid, right? This is not what you're talking about. So I'm not gonna talk about it either. Um, because I think what is what is more interesting um, it, is the very nature of betweenness. So the place that the role that betweenness actually plays in the book um, and the human or the cartilage is a piece of that. And I'm just gonna share my screen because I drew, I made this brilliant slide, which you're all gonna love. Um, so instead of animals and technologies, I found that I kept drawing figures. Um, so in the in the in the side and the margins, I have all of these pictures, especially this bridge, right? Like it's everywhere. I keep draw, kept drawing it and drawing it and drawing it and drawing it. Drawing it. So um, let's see if I can scoot. 
Um, so I won't talk about all of them. Cartilage I already touched on already. Um, so the both and, um, which is to say something which is a parasite and a channel. So you, it's, it's often the case that the both and is showing up, but um, the reason it's worth mentioning here, I think, is that you take real care to say, this is not necessarily in equal measure. Um, so it's, it's not that something both is itself and something else in a kind of perfectly balanced way, but actually in a kind of unequal way um, and, uh, uh, or even a fluctuating right way. And also that it's not necessarily synchronous. So that's to say some, somebody, for example, um, somebody who is currently uh, helping make, we could say a parasite, helping make the electricity system work might previously have been a formal employee of the utility. Right, so that there's a seriality to both and, um, which I thought was also a really nice way to, to sort of reconceptualize the, the concept. Um, then between this and the bridge, so this comes up, uh, you can see on my, my really high quality drawing here that I have kind of two little points and it's because I just over and over and over and I just started to make a list here. There's this, this um, the two point, the two sort of opposite points are there, and then you kind of disregard their oppositeness, oppositeness, and you say, what is holding these things together? What constitutes the bond um, mm -hmm. that allows these two things to exist um, as a practice, right? So rent and plunder, right? Rationing and fake rationing. I like that debt, debt and and theft, ideal and reality, load shedding and blackouts, tolerable and insensible. I began to think about this um, as I went on in the book as a marriage and that there is kind of the acceptable marriage, the normal marriage, and then there's the terrible marriage. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of these moments where two things come together, um, inefficiency and predatory practices or inefficiency is a big one, um, right? Where what you see is not uh, some sort of bridging between um, one thing, rationing, right, and fake rationing, debt and theft, not pulling these things together into relationship, but actually two things on the same side. And that that's this moment at which it doesn't work anymore, or there's too much anger or too much dysfunctionality or breaking of the social. Um, so I have this bridge as a, between purported opposites that hold the world in functionality. Um, and I, I would be interested to know if this is a figure that, that structures your thinking beyond this project. Um, the circuit, um, which I talked about already, the range of normalcy. So um, the range of activity that is not by the book, but that does not rupture the book. This seems to be also a figure which is very common. You also call it the vague hole from um, quoting Jane Goyer. I don't know how to say last name. Um, and I, I think, um, again, as I moved through the book, I felt like the parasite became less important, except maybe in a, this very tiny tick-like structure and more um, a way of making a world functional in a, in a way that never leaves the intensity of, of the social or sort of the, right? So that's, that's always, they're always, because things aren't quite working, there always has to be a lot more conversation and money moving around and little jobs being done and people knowing who they know. Um, so this is what I thought of the range of normalcy. This is my definition. So yeah, um, you can throw it out. The great leaky morass of functionality that never commits entirely to dysfunction because neither that nor pure functionality allows for the dynamic constitutive circulation of souls and energies. Um, I would say that this is somehow seems like the, the core um, of, if the whole book is telling some kind of story, it's somehow that, um, that I got a feel for. The Fatic Tube, um, which I won't, won't talk about much, but I really loved this image of something that is holding an open space, a space open for something later to move through it. And you don't say tube, you don't describe it that way, but 
um, it definitely has the the sense of like even a, a a plastic tube through which an electrical line might later be strong but has not yet been strong right but that's producing all kinds of potentiality by holding a space open i really love this figure it's it shows up a lot in the introduction and then sort of only sort of partially um, as you go on and then cartilage again this thing which is uh, a softness between two hard things that both joins and protects um, those two hard things to, to keep a social knee or a, or a post-socialist country moving, sort of, um, sort of. So that um, is the end. That's what I have to say. Um, but thank you as well for um, inviting me and for letting me think through these um, shapes, I guess. Thank you very much um, for these incisive observations. It's moving us from metaphors to actual vis vis visualization. Oh, sorry, I can't say the word. Um, and so uh, moving on, last but not, not least, we have um, Sabin Mohamed, who actually recently joined our department here. Um, Sabin Mohamed is a political, urban, and economic anthropologist um, here at Johns Hopkins. She received her doctorate in anthropology from the University of Heidelberg in 2021. Her first book project, Emerging Black Empire and Counting Futures in Urban Ethiopia, reframes current thinking on empire, examining the con contemporary global intersections of capital in the East African corridor. Her research reveal, reveals how empire building in Ethiopia is reliant on post-colonial circulations of blackness, as well as embedded in transnational mega projects of urban infrastructure. Her second project explores the overlooked role of women's labor in maritime economies. This project is situated along trade routes and ports of transnational Chinese capital in, in East Africa. She's an athlete faculty member and at the Center for Africana Studies. Before join, joining Hopkins, um, she was a bridge to faculty postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, I'm going to move this so that you can <laughs> see her speak <laughs> more easily. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's always hard to uh, say something when you come last, so I always thought that's something to contribute to. <laughs> Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for this absolutely fantastic book. Um, and just let me dive in right here. Um, so um, energy is everywhere, right? Um, the mere fact that we are coming together today in this like hybrid space is also a testament to the ubiquity of uh, the nature of electricity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but electricity cannot be seen, smelled, or heard. For example, the electric current does not draw attention to itself. The wire it often runs through does not give us a hint of the charge it carries. The skies and wires and grid networks, it affords us a topology of life, a fluid space defined by currents and circulation. Electricity, unlike wood, coal, and petroleum, is not a stored uh, hydrocarbon energy. It is a set of physical phenomena associated with the presence of motion matter, often regarded as an artificial power that has to be produced through a friction fiction or fictional engagement. So unlike fossil fuels, then electricity is always mediated and has really no point of origin. And yet for all the ubiquity of electricity, uh, like Felicia Bakke pointed out, in contemporary modern and urban life, its distribution is highly uneven. During my own field work in Addis Ababa in 2016, blackouts were routine. But there was a, also a rhythm to it. For example, just before protests against the government in 2016 started, there was a noticeable increase in electricity blackouts, and those fallouts often coincided with curfews. The security forces enforcing the curfews were often more concerned with policing and containing perceived energy around young urban residents. Freeing the energy around the use of coal could switch like electricity on and off into disruption environments. For residents in the Ethiopian capital city, the simultaneous experience of an increase of energy blackout and the cutting off of mobile internet data was often an indicator that something somewhere was wrong or happening. In a way, the blackouts enforced a different temporality, no artificial light after sunlight, and the sensorium, charcoal, flashlights, agricultural charcoal. The city electric is an illuminating and necessary book about the anthropology of electricity. 
African socialism and modalities of collective urban life and relations. Mike takes us to the power grid and the lives of urban Tanzanians navigating blackout, unreliable power supply, and a surplus of things that need to be connected to electricity, phone, TV, refrigerators. More in particular, he's interested in how the volatility of the grid stands in relation to electricians, electric companies, utility inspectors, consumers, residents, and imagined futures of unity. Put in simpler terms, he describes the acts of those people in need of electricity and those skilled enough to provide and inspect electricity. For Degani, uh, for Mike, <laughs> the power supply is the kind of power that is the key site of negotiating the social contract in urban Tanzania. The spread of highly uneven institutional capacities and massive forms of dispossession has forced urban residents to improvise and to collaborate in creating solutions collectively. Mike shows us that the grid either conveys power, structural top-down, or channels a collective force to shape and modify the relationship between the rule and the rule. It's about power and the scale, imaginary skills and the productivity of power diffused, dispersed, and circulate from the grid. At the heart of this ethnographic uh, investigation is Tanesco, the Tanzania Electric Supply Company Limited, founded in 1964, just three years after the Tanzania independence. Tanesco is a parastatal organization and owned by the government of Tanzania. So Tanesco offers like a couple of services, right? Um, electric. Uh, electricity generation, electricity transmission, distribution, and sale of electricity. But why the provision of electricity, and also one has to know that almost 80% Mike reminds us, reminds us of, of all these connections are uh, um, concentrated in Dar es Salaam, where he works, has become really expensive since the 1990s, the fall of the Soviet Union and the neoliberal market economy. One of the major problems for Tanesco is the very operation it set out to do to provide people and companies with stable electricity. As Mike writes, and quote, for as power flows out through transition and distribution lines to a bristling mass of consumers, and as a payment flows back to Tanesco, a communicative circuit is formed, one that embodies a shared product of nationhood. And yet the circuit is fragile. Service interruptions, high tariffs, and aging, aging materials all put pressure on the downward flow of current. In turn, consumer, debt, non payment, or vandalism both accommodate this shift and put pressure on the reciprocal upflow of currency. Some of these perturbations are forgivably minor, others reach a level of intensity that calls into question the reciprocal binding these propose, they propose, presuppose. Indeed, a certain flashpoint, networks break down, threatens to erupt into arguments, violence, protests, or even regime change. Mike's important work then narrows in on these instantiations to show, I quote again, how infrastructure becomes a site where the collective ambitions and commitments of an African post colonial nation are both made and unmade, naturalized and suspended. The city electorate is situated in the wake of the moral and political economy. Prevalent during socialism, for example, the monopoly of the power supply run to an old socialist bureaucratic parastatal entity like Tanesco, and the aftermath of British and German colonialism, the infrastructure of the power plant and the grid. I want us to stay with the ambivalent figures that Mike has introduced in this book to understand the nature of the collective power and circulation, Vishoka and Paris. I'm really fascinated by these two figures. And so let me begin with the Shoka and Fuse Israeli word for hatchet. We learn from, the, from Mike that politically, for example, government officials have described the Shoka as agents and agents and touts that promise to offer shortcuts for bureaucratic procedures. Mike describes how the Shoka have come to occupy the figure of the thief and person. People must be wary of them. Yet it is precisely these people, the Shoka, that become crucial so to say, invested with power of the collective and the general in moments of breakdown and electricity fallout. Street electricians, freelancers, and licensed contractors fill the void when electricity providers are not responsive, take too long, or are simply not responsive to the requests of their customers and residents in general. Here we show as the shortcut and alternative and an alternative support system. But they are ambivalent figures in the commodification of and piracy of energy. 
their role adds another layer of ambivalence when they go beyond the service of repair, but manipulate the meter so the customer can use more electricity and pay less, or when the show can help to take shortcuts and avoid payment altogether, or end up doing the con on both the customer and the provider. Mike elegantly shows us in his fascinating ethnography that in order to understand political economies in Africa, beyond the binary of the informal form of capitalist market model, that there is no analytic of the inside and outside different, that, that there is no analytic inside and outside differentiation that makes sense. For example, we show us in this field of energy supply, while treated as thieves from the electric company, are not alien to the state institutions providing electricity at all. Often the street electricians were themselves employed as technicians and electricians in the company before they took their craft skill to the street. More often they come in from the outside, providing repair services at the beginning and work their way up, manipulating energy supply, collaborating with financial officials, and on other occasions they begin describing themselves as bridges between residents and the power supplier. But it's not, it is not only the binary of the formal and former sector that becomes obsolete, but also the division between, infrastructure, between the infrastructure of the energy supply and the middle person providing, cutting, and diverting the energy. Who is taking the home and how does diverting energy become a zero sum game, as often understood when thinking of parasites? Mike asks us, asks us to think about parasites in this context too. For one, because these people providing services without the formal permission of the energy supplier are named as such parasites or thieves or tricksters. And secondly, because Mike is thinking about the act of doing something with the grid, taking care, repairing grid, and manipulating the grid through the conceptual lens of parasites inspired by Michel Thoreau. Mike and Sarah pushes us to strip the connotations of the parasite in a threefold way. One, biological, a parasite, an organism that lives in a body or under the skin or host. It harms the body and is understood as an energy drainer without providing any benefit. Secondly, socially, we understand parasites as people that only take and drain resources, but give nothing in return. And thirdly, for Ceres, a parasite is static or noise in the system. Organized systems exist in opposition to noise. This is very important. Through his meticulous archival of ethnographic work, Mike compels us to consider the parasite as a site of potential generativity and a fundament and fundamentally relational. Sarah says the parasite's relation is with the relation, not the station. In Mike's case, it's not the plug on wire and the grid. The shoka are emerging in Africa. They can be channel, medium, content, and energy. They are named the shoka because their emergence indicates the boundaries of the system they emerge from. They are only noise because the system says they are out of play. That is, what would be understood classically as the host, the energy supply, is not a static entity but rather an environment that is always relational and shifting and only to the Paris and only in relation to the parasite. One can even go further and wonder if the power supply itself is not parasitic too, mm -hmm. occupying the material infrastructure for the power to emerge. Yet what are the implications conceptually and ethnographically here? What are the consequences for a theory of subject and object if we follow the example of my, my work? How do we situate the agents that intersect with the shoka and the parasite? How does thinking of parasite and the shokas alter our understanding of human and the non-human, the vital and the material? What does the parasite say to us? Thinking about parasite and the shoka compels me to think fundamentally about electricity as a site of energy, ownership, and politics. Who owns these fields of power? Does the thief as well as the parasite, those people cutting energy, point to a larger question on how we think about ownership, the commons, and circulation? What are the futures imagined when people contest the ownership of the energy supply and take energy, especially when no one seems to be losing? Except, of course, um, the customer, maybe, that leaves the last one. How does the grid transform into, into a secret space of the commons carried on the old socialist democratic entity? At the same time, I had to think about Donna Haraway's cyborg that contests the idea of the organism as a site of reproduction. In general, she writes against the rigid boundaries of the human and animal, machine and human. And I quote her, the cyborg does not dream of community on the model of the organic family. 
this time without the audit field project, decided would not recognize the garden of Eden. It is not made of mud and cannot dream of returning to dust. Instead of identity, she proposes coalitions and affinities. So to think of speculative futures through organisms and ecologies of the grid, not only points to the concentration of the power energy break downs, but also how people connect, cut off, and shift concentration. Power is not only located in labels and offices, but can suddenly be diverted in this relation. One wonders if this is because of the unwieldy force fields of energy or because there is a particularity to the history of African socialism. And if so, how African are these social, social contracts in the aftermath of socialism? Mike shows us in this beautiful ethnography how Parasite and Bishopa gave us a better understanding of the power supply, but also how residents negotiate a social contract. Yet I want to stick with Mike's challenge of intervention of Parasite. It reminded me of the metaphoric phrase, don't shoot the messenger. Mm -hmm. Because following, my, following Mike's uh, approach, the messenger is the message and the outlet that conveys the content. Mm -hmm. So who do we blame when something goes wrong? And who takes responsibility for bad news? Secondly, electricity is mediated. But what does electricity tell us about parasites if we turn it around instead of seeing parasites occupy electricity? While thinking through the parasite helps Mike understand electricity, I think Mike does an amazing job of the inverse here too, helping us understand the parasite. If we understand the parasite in its common usage to be the addendum, the asymmetrical, an unwanted symbiotic, the grifter, the thief, the corrupt, that which gets in the way of the desired, wanted, and our functionality in order, Mike's book shows us how the parasite is always a part of mediation and redistribution central nodes in sociality and industry. We get to rethink the theme here and also corruption outside of its normative, eth uh, normative ethical discourses and within a rejigging of what constitutes the public good. Maybe this also call to make collectively more noise become thieves to shift the relations we have to markets in our own. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabine. Um, your comments are always very eye opening. Um, so, before um, leaving the floor to Mike for a response, um, I will. We will hear from um, Laurel Crawford from Towards an Open Monograph Ecosystem. Um, can we? Yeah. There we go. Hey everybody, I'm Laurel Crawford. I'm from the JHU Libraries. Um, and I help administer the grant program called TOME, or T uh, Towards an Open Monograph Ecosystem. Um, it, this is a way of publishing scholarly monographs open access. That's the point of the program. Um, just to make sure everybody knows, open access is a way of, uh, sorry, it, it refers to scholarly works that are freely accessible to anyone, free to read. Um, Traditionally, scholarly information has been locked behind paywalls. You all know this. <laughs> They're expensive. Um, but today, libraries and scholars and presses are working together to try to open up some of that so that it becomes free read for everybody in the world. Um, I think all of us would agree that it's good for humanity uh, if we all have a free access to important new ideas and um, some of the answers that scholars are thinking about to the world's most pressing problems. But I also would like to point out that we think it's even more important when we think about the context uh, here, works about by and for people who don't have the access that we enjoy to well-funded institutions with access to many, many scholarly materials like we do here in the US. Um, some of you may be familiar with open access fees. If you have worked in STEM fields or if you know people in the STEM fields, you may know that they have to pay some hefty open access fees to make their articles open for everybody to read. That really does not work in the economy of monograph publications in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. So the reason that the TOM program, it's really a movement, they call it, uh, was established was so that we can start creating an economy and an ecosystem that will fund these types of works to be open for everybody. So the way that works here at Hopkins is that provost um, 
who more generously granted us funding for um, I think it's eight in total so far. It's been over a few years. I'm new to Hopkins and I've just arrived. So I've uh, taken over part of the administration of this program. Um, the libraries provide administrative support and we're also working with lots of other institutions. Duke Press is another institution in the program so that so they published this book. We provided the funding and the administrative support. We're all working together. A whole bunch of us are getting together at a meeting next week to talk more about how we can make this sustainable for the future. Um, we still have two more tone grants to give out this year, so I would encourage everyone to apply. Please think about doing so. There are there is a if you Google JHU tone, you'll see the website. Um, all the information is there. And my name is Laurel. I'm the only Laurel in the library, so I'm pretty easy to find. If you have any questions about how it works, please let me know. Um, I do also want to let y'all know that we, the libraries really cares about open access. They hired me to help with this. <laughs> so uh, we run a lot of programs that do financial support for open access. And we also provide consulting services on how to make your work open access. So please do reach out if you have any questions about how we can better support you or any suggestions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thanks thank for coming. Okay, so now I will give the floor to Mike for a response before we go on. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. How and where uh, does one even begin? Um, I guess by saying um, it, it's really just overwhelming. Thank you to the organizers, Jorge, Jonas, uh, everybody who's kind of put this together. Um, it's, it's really a gift. And of course, thank you to like these wonderful uh, discussants um, and your uh, incredible comments. Um, so basically, I think I'm going to just start kind of um, grabbing bits and pieces of different thoughts and ideas and see if we can kind of put them together in some sort of reasonable configuration and, and probably not take too long so we can open it up because God knows you've all um, had to deal with enough of my words. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I'll, I'll start with Gretchen because I think uh, you may have to leave soon. So I'll just say like very quickly, um, thank you for that diagram. I want to print it out and, you know, frame it and put it on my office wall. Um, because I do think it's sort of like if a book could dream, like what were the, what would the dream images be? And like these diagrams and, and kind of schematics um, capture something about the way the book's dream world or its unconscious kind of works, right? The kind of basic images that it's that it's working with. Um, uh, I would say that I think you are right that um, there is this interesting uh, series, almost you can almost think of them as transformations of each other, these series of images, right? The, bri the bridge, the circuit, the two, um, the kind of zone, right, of tolerability. Um, yeah, all of these are, are kind of refractions of this same basic preoccupation that I think is intrinsic to something like an, inf an electric infrastructure and intrinsic to my kind of conceptual con like preoccupations, which is the relation, right? Like it's just a very basic way of saying like um, an infrastructure relates. It is the middle zone between point A and point B, right? Or between self and other, producer and consumer, right? Here and there, origin and destination. Right. And so what are some conceptual resources for thinking that relation? And I think what your diagrams point to is all of the strange ways that relation can be configured. Right. And, and you know, what happens in the middle along the pathway by which you get from point A to point B. Um, and uh, and in particular, the contradictions and paradoxes emerge. Right. Um, you know, uh, probably first and foremost, the idea that some measure of quote unquote dysfunction, right, is intrinsic to securing the relation. It's what, um, it, it's what gives you some traction, right? It gives you some measure of what, of how things should work ideally. Um, so, um, you know, and, and, and you, can, you can see this in all sorts of ways and, and interesting kind of, um, precedents in, in the literature, right? I mean, I think of Jim Scott talking about the work to rule strike, right? Which is that if you were to follow every rule, 
if you were to take the man out of the loop every time, right, as like when taxi workers do a work to rule strike, uh, uh, the whole system would break down, right? Because you need that little bit of flux, that little bit of give, that little bit of human discretion mm -hmm. to make any such any such system work. And, mm -hmm. and that's like, of course, you know, Dar Salaam and, and the electric crit there is like a great window onto that truism, if you like, right? Um, because it does take all of this discretion and negotiation to make things happen. I think that does connect to some of the like really wonderful provocations that Yunus um, has, has uh, rightfully lobbed at me about the politics of the air conditioner and the veranda. And Yunus, um, you know, you have been part of this project in so many ways as a friend, as an interlocutor, as a kind of inspiration, as a sounding board. So it is really special that um, that you were able to comment on it. Thank you, Asante. Um, but nevertheless, we're left with some kind of good questions about what I'm calling the politics of the air conditioner and the veranda, right? Um, and so um, I'll start with the politics of the air conditioner. Again, to me, the the general fantasy of the politics of the air conditioner is to have something so procedurally defined and um, so kind of airtight and so kind of, let's say, capital and techno intensive that human judgment and discretion falls out of it. And all you have are rules, right? You have a kind of utopia of rules or something like that. Um, and again, to me, that, that kind of, um, calls back to Gretchen's point about the man in the loop. And the engineering fantasy is you always take the man out of the loop. And I would say that this particular version of neoliberalism, which to me really starts um, coming to life in the 1990s, in which there's this sense that we can make society work, right? We just need to have the right rules. We just need to have the right procedures. We need to have the right technology. Um, we have to get rid of politics, right? In a very big sense. Um, you know, I think that is the defining characteristic of what I, following like Emmanuel Touré and, and Tim Kelsaw, call the politics of the air conditioner. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ready to ride on that. Nevertheless, Eunice, I think your provocation is right in the sense that like, okay, is this something that was simply imported by like well-meaning, you know, liberal do-gooders and NGOs? Are there not sort of local genealogies with which that importation resonates? And I think you're absolutely right. I think you're the person to tell us about it, right? I mean, I think this is kind of what your work is about in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, um, the, the answer is to hear more from you on that particular score. But I will say that the, but, but there is something like redemptive about the politics of the air conditioner, right? I, I do see that. And I tried to kind of gesture to it in the book in the sense that like, um, yeah, there, there's a kind of morality towards following the rule, right? Towards everybody being subject to the same set of criteria and expectation. Um, and, um, you know, that idea, I think, does get a lot of local uptake. And so the way that plays out in the power sector, of course, is privatization, right? And so like this idea that the South African company was, was gonna come in, they were gonna set, you know, dis they were gonna sort of commercialize Tinesco's operations. They were gonna get everybody following the rules. They sent incentive targets, right? And in a way, um, there's something very patronizing about that. But in another way, it had a lot of popularity in the sense that people thought, well, like prepaid meters, you know, uh, they do take the man out of the loop. They do take the kind of bumptious meter readers who come strolling up to your house and kind of, um, you know, misestimate how much you owe or try and solicit a bribe, right? And so there is something kind of redemptive and interesting about that moment, right? And, and so um, for me, I, I never want to lapse into this sort of easy game of sort of castigating the neoliberal. I think that both the politics of the veranda and the air conditioner are two aspects of it. And I think they both draw on what came before it in really interesting ways. And so that does take me to the politics of the veranda very quickly. Yeah, the Barraza. Um, to me, the Barraza, you're right to point to the kind of gerontocratic and very male gendered space that the Barraza can be. Um, and, uh, 
And, and so I take that resonance, right? So the Verand, so the reason I call it the politics of the veranda, again, this comes from Emmanuel Ture. It also has it gestures back to the kind of colonial regimes where, you know, colonists and even some anthropologists, right, would hang out on the veranda. They would call up the kind of um, you know, local officials and tell them what's going on and, and kind of govern from afar and govern in a kind of secluded way. Um, that was relatively sort of unconnected to popular demand. Um, and so that sense of the Barraza as a bunch of like old men getting together and kind of yammering um, and deciding and deciding amongst themselves, I think that tracks. Nevertheless, the fact that the Barraza is usually, as you say, on a porch out quasi public in the street so that passerby can come and sit and talk and join in, I think that gives it a somewhat different quality than what I think of as the veranda, which to me is very secluded, right? To me, it's a bunch of elites who make decisions without popular input and in ways that benefit themselves. So like, I think you're right to say that there are those resonances and it would be interesting to figure out what the precise definition of veranda would be. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that, that's what I would say, but those are like very well taken points. Um, Going on to Goche's uh, wonderful comments. Um, Goche, thank you so much for just sort of capturing um, something very obvious in a way that I didn't even really realize, which is just the kind of metaphor mania that grips this book sometimes. Um, I, I think that's right. Um, and I'm sort of pleased to see this menagerie of these sort of that you've cataloged that have been sort of skulking around the, the pages as it were that I didn't even really notice per se. Um, and, and even more really interesting and incisive ideas about how the sort of organic, uh, what, what would you say, the kind of biological province of many of those metaphors contrast or not uh, with these kind of techno material metaphors like the air conditioner, the veranda, the, the minibus and, and so on. Um, I will just say as an aside that Eunice has also written a lot about kind of animal metaphors. So this is something I'll have to think about with him as well. Um, to me, modal reasoning and, um, right, so, right, so how do, so this is a good question. How do, how do we answer this? this question about what is the relation between the relatively biological and the relatively technical. One is to simply go back to Sarah's, right? Um, you know, as, as um, Sabina said, for Sarah's, the parasite is a kind of figure of thought that spans both the biological and the technical and the social, right? And so um, he sees no real strong distinction between them. I find that a very appealing way to think about it. So for me, um, yes, uh, these animals are organisms in their environment, right? And so they are trying to make a go of it, finding that range of normality, uh, finding the kind of range of variation in which they can operate or not. Um, but I think that um, that holds just as well for the minibus. I mean, yeah, the minibus has certain elements that are reticulated and skeletal and relatively inflexible. And yet there are all these other dimensions to it, the kind of soft, maybe the cartilage-like dimensions of it, uh, namely the people um, that have to kind of find a way to live together. So I would just want to say that, um, you know, I, I would hope that modal reasoning could apply to both sets of metaphors, but it's an interesting thing to think about. About metaphor more broadly, the last thing I will say is that, you know, a metaphor is a path, right? And so there's a kind of thematic resonance there as well, right? Again, if the basic concern with Sarah is, is to say, what lies between the stations? What is the relation, the third, right? The pathway that lies between them? Well, the metaphor is the thing that connects the one term to the other, right? Love is a rose, right? What is the thing that connects love and rose here? It's their metaphoric connection, right? It's, their, it's the qualities that join together in a kind of metaphoric resonance, mm -hmm. right? So for me, as a kind of analytical or conceptual strategy, um, I, I feel just fine with metaphors. I mean, I think the idea here is that you find pathways of connection uh, however you can, and this is one way in which you do it, right? There are ways you could write it out. There are ways you could 
quantify analyses. And I, of course, try and do some of that. But certainly for an anthropological or ethnographic approach to something like the power grid, which is so often the domain of engineers um, who want to eliminate the social, the imaginative, um, I would sort of humbly place my bets on metaphor as a way to think otherwise, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and more than that, you know, as a way in which like people everywhere think otherwise, right? I mean, you know, when I talk about sharks and snakes and bats, it's not me who's making those connections, mm -hmm. right? This is me trying to think myself through all the stuff that I'm hearing, right? Think my analysis through all the stuff I'm hearing. So like, yeah, utility workers are called bats and, you know, um, uh, you know, elite politicians are called like tree trunks or sharks, right? And so like taking a cue from that kind of vernacular kind of incisiveness appeals to me. I think it's a, an appropriate and a powerful way of, of doing anthropology. Um, but, you know, your mileage will vary on that. Um, then, and then I think maybe the last thing I'll say um, about um, Sabina's like wonderful, like wonderful deep um, kind of um, recapitulation and interrogation of, of the book's main themes is, yeah, so right. So like, what's the point of the parasite, right? Uh, you know, on some level, you know, um, are we not in a position where we, we can no longer distinguish between the messenger and the message between the, the kind of, um, between the thief and the kind of hero or whatever it is. And I think that to me, that is a limitation of Sarah's in some ways, like Sarah's is pretty content to kind of observe and catalog that impasse, right? And to me, I think the ethnographic task of taking up Sarah's is to see like, well, how does that get resolved in a particular mm -hmm. place, right? And so to me that, and so like, that's my idea of like what the thresholds are, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's there's some threshold that makes the parasitic uh, problem of a blackout um, separate from the parasitic problem of a fake blackout, which then becomes a real social issue. And so finding those thresholds that define the difference between like, okay, I haven't paid because I owe or I haven't paid because I'm stealing, like that to me is a really interesting strategy for thinking about a life world in a certain kind of sense, right? So Sarah's gives us the tools to like, find it and then how it gets operationalized in any particular milieu i think is like an interesting task and i had a lot of fun trying to suss out this kind of operating logic right like you know it's one thing you know to to, to take 10 percent off the top it's another thing to take 80 percent off the top right and so like those distinctions that people work with that's what makes a world meaningful it seems to me hmm. the broader point though i think about sarah's and um and, and where this gets us in terms of like what this means for anthropology is, you know, a big theme of the book that wasn't necessarily brought up in these comments per se, but I think is latent in all of them is that, or, or a background idea is the idea of cohabitation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and one for me, very basic definition of ecology is the cohabitation, right? How do you get a bunch of different actors and dynamics and materials that are all thrown together in some more or less delimited zone? And how do they resolve themselves in such a way that it keeps going, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, um, finding those thresholds of, of what you can tolerate, of what you will tolerate, what you won't, what you can, what you must, Right, that to me opens up a space of anthropological analysis that is about like how people and things live together. And I think that kind of going to Gauthier's observations at the very beginning of her comments about climate change and renewable energy. I mean, that's like the large, that's like the that's like the far horizon of the book, right? Is that you have these systems in which you have people with different interests and capacities and, and kind of uh, capabilities. How do you arrive at some sort of systemic stability that is not perfect? It's not man out of the loop. It's not perfectly functional, but it's good enough mm -hmm. so that it keeps kind of staggering forward. I mean, I think this is like the basic question of like, how are we going to live on this planet? Mm -hmm. So in a weird kind of condensed way, 
this book, of course, is about something very specific. It has a lot of roots in African studies and the anthropology of the state, right? But it's fruits, right? The thing that it's going to gesture to and that hopefully it will give rise to mm -hmm. is this much larger question about like ecology, like how do we live together, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking about who's the parasite and who's not, what are the thresholds? That to me, you begin to get a lexicon and a set of analytical tools for thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, there's so much more, um, but again, I've talked quite a bit. Um, so uh, I'll just say again, Thank you all so much. I'm, I'm honestly overwhelmed. It's, it's such a privilege. And uh, I look forward to like thinking about these comments and not just putting them in a circular file. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we will open the floor for questions. Um, for those on Zoom, I'm going to suggest that you write in chat. If you want to speak, that would that will really help me keep track of both the, um, you know, the attendees on Zoom and then the room. Um, yeah, so who wants to go first? Anand? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, this is just such a treat. They, uh, thank you all. Thanks to all the panelists for such amazing comments. I was so, um, gripping just to kind of hear these different renditions of the book. And thanks especially to the students for putting on such an amazing event and series of events. It was extraordinary. Seriously, kudos, honestly. Um, and thanks to Mike for making this possible, right? Um, it's it, it's such a delight. I'm, I, I'm just thinking, reading that, like that, that note that you ended on um, about how we live together and that project of figuring that out, but trying to kind of route that back through what Sabina was saying around this, this ecology of relations, what, um, what Gretchen was saying and making recourse to these figures and what Gokja was doing in pointing out these metaphors that animate the book, not just as sort of, you know, arbitrary excrescences, but as, as material that's essential to the very like formal argument, right? So, so what, thinking about all that together, it, it strikes me that one way to, to kind of read this and thinking again then about Gokcha's initial challenge, right? So how do we get to the climate crisis? How do we get to sustainability? I think one answer that the book gives us is this question, of how to live together is not an abstract question because we are in fact already living here. I feel like that's actually what the book demonstrates. So if we really lean into the kind of ecological thinking that, that Sabina was taking us through, right, and use that as a way of kind of reading what is happening here, that's, that's what we began to see. So, um, so Gretchen used this, this language of the man in the loop and the necessity of acknowledging the man in the loop. But the metaphors that uh, Gokcha reminds us of basically you know, then forces us to acknowledge that the man is never a man, right? The man is a hatchet, the man is a bat. So it's not the man in the loop, it's the bat in the loop. It's the hatchet in the loop, right? The loop is not a loop without all of these other things, right? Like these, all these non-human animal presences are what makes the system viable, right? So in some ways, I feel like the beauty of the book from an ecological standpoint, I don't know if you quite say this explicitly, because there's always the next thing, right? Um, is, that, is that this is a system whose sustainability, whose continuity, this is a circuit, right? Circuit breaker, um, you know, whose continuity depends on the necessary intrinsic discontinuity of all these other beings that make the flow possible. Yeah, I mean, incredibly well said. I, I, yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that cer certainly, you know, this gets a little bit to, you know, this stuff about sort of missions and, and so forth. But like, there is a there is a literal ecological background to it oh, yeah. in a non metaphoric sense. In in the sense that like. So much of this is actually set into motion by rainfall or the lack thereof, mm -hmm. right? Like so much of all of this stuff about power reform is like, well, there have been a series of droughts in East Africa with increasing severity and frequency mm -hmm. since at least the 1990s, right? 
And it's the harnessing and conversion of um, water into current, right? That makes um, that makes this whole thing possible because at least for very a long time, 50% of the fuel mix was hydropower. So, you know, the idea that um, the, the idea that on some level having people like the idea that on some level this is not just a techno artifact, but it is in fact something connected to the wider weave mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. Water, fish, snake, bats, farmers, crops, all of that is sort of in the background. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of a bunch of my new project stuff, I think, is going to try and take more seriously the water aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's all very true. And then I'll just say that, like, yeah, so so what is this alternative imaginary if it's not a loop and it's not just men, certainly just men? Um, and, you know, thinking back to Sabina's quotation of Donna Haraway, right? So we're not thinking about the family as the model for living together, mm. right? That's not going to work um, for reasons that have been extensively documented. Um, the, the answer that Sarah gives is that the model for living together in sociality is the host guest relation, right? For better or worse, it's mm -hmm. the host guest relation. Mm -hmm. Host guest relation in a social register and in a biological register, mm -hmm. right? We depend on water. We are its guests. We are its parasites, right? We depend on it. We divert it. We use it to our own ends and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that that is a pretty, um, I don't think it explains everything, but I think it's a really suggestive idiom for thinking about how we live together in an ecological way. It's like hospitality, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It's like actually, mm -hmm. it doesn't get a lot, like, because it's, what is ecology? It's like living in harmony with nature and something. But the dynamics of hosting and guesting, of hospitality, of that strange dance of taking someone into your home delimiting them, maybe feeding them, right? Knowing when to expel them, right? Um, that is, you know, and, and of course, what is, what, is the, um, what is the vernacular? It's like hosts um, and fish are the same, or guests and fish are the same, they stink after three days, yeah. right? So like, I think the host guest relation is like, pair it with the cyborg, mm -hmm. right? Like pair it. Like put put those together and see that. Yeah. Mike, uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was great. I really enjoyed it. And I also wanted to say that you're going to be missed in the department. Mm -hmm. uh, best of luck with the move. Uh, so I have two very short questions. One is about uh, this transformation that is taking place, and it's I'm just uh, borrowing from my uh, experience paying bills. Um, you know, there's a shift to, uh, you know, installing your own solar panels, which mm -hmm. is taking place both in the U.S., but I also experienced that in Pakistan. So in some sense, people are not only consumer, consumers, but also producers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that just completely shifts the yeah. kinds of networks that you're talking totally. about. So I, I want to get your thoughts on that horizon because you're still getting to those uh, questions. And the second question I have is also about uh, the massive balance of payment prices that a lot of countries are facing in the global south where you know you need to import fuels uh, to make your power plants work mm -hmm. but uh, you know it's it becomes a political question some governments come and you know have road sharing for two hours uh, others would you know uh, be able to reduce so it's a question about how much fuel you can import uh, in these uh, extremely stressful uh, times economically yeah. so like i was wondering how your uh, project and if I draw the that question. Of importing fuel? Yeah. 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 So like, thanks, Anola. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm gonna miss everyone here too. Um, well, yeah, so on the on the question of solar panels, I mean the book ends with just the tiniest like hint of, of what that's gonna be like. Um, but it is true, the price of solar panels have dropped. Uh, they're they're relatively affordable, even for people in Dar es Salaam. Uh, although there's a range of quality. Um, and it does, I mean, what I basically what I what I say is that it does reconfigure the state. It, it turns people into more isolated, autonomous kind of units, their households. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of precedents for this, right? I mean, um, there, it's a kind of strategy of self-enclosure that Africanist social scientists have been writing about since mm -hmm. the 80s, 
Hmm. Right. Um, and in fact, Daniel Jordan Smith just came out with a book called Every Household Its Own Government that kind of speaks to this idea. Right. Is that in fact, there's a lot of power in disconnecting yourself and having a kind of fortress enclave version of provisioning. And I think that's right. Um, I nevertheless think that in my experience, what I've seen is that it's rarely so stark that solar power still is not scaled, that it's not reliable enough. Um, that maybe it works for some lights and some phones, but that's it. We're not, you can't have a fridge and sell cold drinks, you know, and, um, you know, you can't have too much stuff going on. And so what I see instead is this kind of mix and match whereby you might have solar, um, but you have a grid connection as a backup or the vice versa, right? In which you're constantly sort of toggling back and forth and you have this kind of, um, uh, repertoire, right? This kind of portfolio of provisioning strategies because you can never really count on any which one. And so the introduction of solar is like very laudable, right? But again, there's always this temptation to be like, well, we've solved it, <laughs> right? It's going to be solar from here on out and we're going to climb the energy ladder and it's a teleological imaginary where we're just going to the next phase. And um, I've just learned by being in this place in the world to be very wary of those arguments. I mean, I just don't think you ever get it. The future never arrives that clean, right? Um, and so, and then beyond that, there's also the political valence of what it means to be connected to a grid or not, right? And I think there is a kind of way in which the idea that everyone is left to fend for themselves has a certain valence there, but it's also, you know, people want to be provided for. Right, and there's a kind of demand or an expectation that your government should provide that for you. There is a kind of social contract, mm -hmm. and I should just say parenthetically, like it's kind of crazy to me that anthropologists don't have a very strong conceptual takedown or excavation of the social contract. I mean, I looked, like I looked when I was writing this book, I couldn't find it. I really couldn't. I mean, it's there, there's gestural things to it, but it's not very strong. Mm. But the idea that you are in this relation of host and guest or some sort of reciprocity with the state that is supposed to provide for you is an obvious vernacular truism in so many parts of the world. The last thing I'll say about the importing fuel, I mean, this was the problem with inter independent power producers, right? Um, like importing fuel is expensive. There is a desire for a kind of national autonomy. The details of it are, are tricky and it will depend on the particular, um, the, the particular country and, and so on. But like, it very rarely works out if you're in a situation where you have to import fuel for, for power production. It just rarely works out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we have a question on Zoom. Um, I'm sorry, I did not mean that um, the participants on Zoom should write their questions. I will give you the floor. It's just so that you know, if you can ask for the floor on, on the chat, that will help my help me um, keep track. Um, Lennon Zhang. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Dagani, for presenting this book. Um, it's really intriguing, actually. When I learned that it was published, I was trying to get a copy of it, but it was a, a bit difficult to uh, to navigate this terrain. Um, so, um, but yeah, uh, like uh, um, I'm I'm very intrigued by the figure of the parasite, uh, and as we have talked about and discussed already, how parasite has this modern a metaphor kind of descriptive power of the political situation that you're trying to describe there. Um, I was wondering that um, if parasitism is a possibility in the ecology, then you know, in ecology, there are a whole bunch of other metaphors, like they're, they're predator prey, they're, they're mutualism, they're like, uh, like endosymbiosis and all those things seems to be, if, if, if parasitism is a possibility, then there are a whole bunch of other possibilities that can use to describe political situations um, in creative and sometimes accurate ways. Um, and also uh, responding to the earlier comment about uh, the, 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 the relationship between the, me the mechanical and the, and the, the, the sort of the vital, the, the animal metaphors, 
Um, I was wondering, can we, because my specialization is in multi-species and try to study infrastructure uh, built by Chinese in, in the Amazon, I was wondering if you have particular insights or thought about mobilizing multi-species ethnography and infrastructure studies together to actually study those animal, I mean, we talk about human machine metaphors and animal human metaphors, but can we talk about animal machine metaphors to yeah. learn more about um, how, what are those possibilities? And circling back to the question about the Anthropocene, maybe that could be a way, I think, to really think about and really reimagining our politics in, in more concrete ways, I hope. Thanks. Lennon. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I have, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really like these questions. The first thing I'll say is I completely agree with you in the sense that, yeah, why not start mobilizing a bunch of ecological metaphors for the things we see around us in the world, right? So like, I'm thinking of, if you look back in like the 19th century political cartoons, right? How did they used to depict um, like uh, uh, standard oil? Right, it was as a it was as an octopus, right? It was as a like a squid with all of its kind of like tentacles and everything, right? Which was this great way to kind of both talk about um, kind of the perils of monopolization and the sense of a kind of eating, right? Mm. And there's something to me that always strikes me as very visceral and very compelling about that, right? And so like we talk about monopolies, for instance, in this sort of somewhat abstracted, desiccated technocratic language, right? Like, you know, um, you know, scale and uh, provision of service and so on. But there just seems to be um, something that gets illuminated if you start thinking about it in a way that is connected to the dynamics of the world we see around us, mm -hmm. right? So I think, like, I'm all for it, right? Like, start kicking those metaphors out, like, why not? Um, that's one thing I would say. I think they have an enormous explanatory power for the Anthropocene, because if the Anthropocene is to say, well, the distinction between us and the rest of the world doesn't really hold water anymore, then yeah, we can start seeing these things in terms of eating, prey, commensality, and so on. I, I think that's absolutely on point. I will say that, um, and I just kind of quasi to be, be quasi provocative, tongue in cheek, I think the parasite is the master metaphor, right? I think the parasite wins over all of these others, right? <laughs> I, I think that conceptually, it is the governing one, right? Um, one argument for that is in Sarah's himself, right? If you read Sarah's and you read the first chapter, and, and you know, folks in my ecologies and ecology seminar, economy seminar have to read it, right? He says. Yes, but surely you will object that the parasite doesn't explain all of these things, right? Uh, is it really right to say that um, men are parasitic on animals? After all, we hunt animals, right? And then he says, but you start thinking about it and you realize that we make leather jackets from, from cow's skin and we put, you know, uh, we, we weave um, sort of silk from the silkworm into it and we start wearing these animals as clothes, right? And we become, we start taking up residence within their husks. Right. And so I think that um, maybe a better term is not as a governing metaphor, but it's it's the translator. You can translate any of those into parasitic relations. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's good because it's kind of provocative. Right. It, it kind of decenters our sense of a kind of nobility. Right. It's, there's something squishy and ugly about it that is interesting to think with. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that its emphasis on the the ultimate asymmetry of relations, mm -hmm. right? Um, the fact that there's always a kind of, the parasite is always an interruption between you and it, and between some organism and its environment, right? That can be understood in terms of prey, in terms of eating next to, like commensality, right? Um, all that different stuff. So you can, you know, people, you can agree or not. I think the parasite like wins, um, <laughs> but one might expect that from, if you read the book. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we have another question on Zoom, and I will read this one out loud. Um, maybe adding, uh, and this is coming from Laura Mee. 
Uh, maybe adding on to Lennon's question, I also wonder about how the idea of the parasite would translate into a local Tanzanian context, maybe as Vimalaya, but as um, but as that um, mm. terms not widely used among folks I know there, perhaps more broadly as Wadudu. Do you think there's any local idioms, knowledge, practices around what do do that might complicate, challenge, expand upon SARS? Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. Great question, and, and thanks for, for tuning in. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, what was particularly like interesting and, and like actionable about the parasite for this book was that um, there are these range of cognates in Kiswahili, right? And so Wadudu, absolutely one of them, um, which it just sort of means bugs, right? Like little, like vermin, basically. Um, the one that I find the most compelling is the, um, well, there's a couple, right? One is kupe, which is tick, right? Which is the kind of standard stereotypical image of the parasite. And, and kupe, makupe uh, has this very charged, as I'm sure you know, Laura, has this very charged kind of um, political valence. It, it referred to exploiters in the socialist era, particularly capitalists or sort of um, uh, mercantilists, right? And so, again, this, this conflation of the biological and the social, um, you see it in, in, in kupe, makupe. But then the other one, which is a bit more uh, general is, uh, which I talk about in the book is uh, unyonyaji, the, the wanyonyaji, right? The, the sucker or the suckler, right? Um, and uh, also the exploitation, um, also, the, also the kind of exploitation connotations, but the specific definition of suckling, of diverting some vital flow from some organism, I think that's what makes it very, very Sarah's esque. Um, one thing I've talked about with Eunice is that, like, we you, Tanzanians will talk about wanyonyaji in a kind of negative way, but like a baby suckling at the breast, you use the same word kunyonya. And there's this really interesting question about threshold, like how long should a child suckle at the breast before um, it's too much and it's too late, right? Uh, how do you trans? Like, how do you? separate that out so that the child grows up properly. Um, so like, yeah, there's all these local vernaculars. And that's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, we have all this kind of local theory at our mm -hmm. fingertips. Like, why not start using it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about Vimalaya. Um, but, I, but I think it's operative in, in, in the field site, absolutely. Any other thoughts? Thank you so much for the, this book and for inviting me, Mike. Um, I had the privilege of reading this while over the past two weeks writing Dala Dallas and the Blackouts in Tanzania, which was a really interesting experience. And um, my one question for you is um, how do you see this book fitting in, in relation to classic African anthropology literature on um, relationality and communalism in African societies, such as um, Jane Dwyer's, Dwyer's work on individuality and Richard Turner and all these classic texts on, um, on African humanity and different ontologies of relationality. Do you see this as a updated neoliberal, neoliberal take on this or a view of this phenomenon through a post-socialist lens? Or how, how do you see this fitting into this? lineage of literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's like the African studies genealogy, like, yeah, it's right. It, it's there um, for, for anyone who wants to kind of pull at it, I think, I hope. Um, yeah, so I mean, the one thing, obviously, um, you know, Jane Geyer is like, just, you know, her marginal gain was like my Bible in the field. Like I read on Dala Dallas, right? And um, and and Jane, I think is there's a there's a tacit relationship that I haven't entirely worked out in my own head between Geyer's work on conversion and Sarah's on the parasite, right? But essentially what Geyer says is like conversion denies the fantasy of equivalence, right? I pay you for this, you pay me for that. The two values are equivalent. 
What a conversion does is thematize the movement of that transaction and shows that there's all sorts of work that usually gets black boxed mm -hmm. out, right? But in African contexts, for a series of historical reasons related to colonialism and, and dependency, um, the fantasy of being able to black box that out, of saying that you know the transaction costs of actually making that movement, you cannot do that. You have to thematize it as part of the negotiation, right? So in a very obvious way, making a, a journey in Tanzania, you have to factor in that someone's gonna stop you and demand payment. You just have to, right? And you have to, you have to figure out how much you're gonna pay, how much you're gonna fight, how much you're gonna argue, whatever. And so the idea that you can't just abstract out a fantasy of like un, unimpeded movement, to me that's very like African for lack of a better term. Like that's just in the literature and the history, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's where I see a big kind of relation. The other thing is that like, um, you know, Mike McGovern is in this book quite a bit and, and he writes about socialist states and, and kind of the socialist legacy is one in which I think um, people learn how to, how to live together, right? And, and I think, so like, there's this long, there's this whole comparative angle in chapter two about like Tanzania and Kenya mm -hmm. and, and Tanzania's relative lack of political violence versus Kenya's, you know, somewhat more pronounced violence. Um, and I think there's a good case to be made that socialist states managed to avoid the worst of that kind of civil conflict, right? Precisely because it thematized the idea that you have to figure out how to live together, mm -hmm. right? And so that's part of it too for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I hope you find some of this like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. but thanks for comment and reading. We may have time for one more question. If not, then <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us. Let me remind um, those in Baltimore that we will actually continue this conversation on Sunday um, at 2 p.m. Um, for a book reading and some more comments and an open floor discussion um, here in Baltimore at Redemas. And if you plan on joining us, please register. Um, we have the link on the posters and um, maybe we can also share it in chat, just in case. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to uh, everybody. Thank you for coming and participating. It means a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we have some food here also. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Oh my God, I really have to. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>